terms of fly, really, uh, and I've got probably 40 different damselflies that I've tied and played with and just like everybody else, but I'm using an olive thread. This happens to be six aught. You can see six or eight aught, like I said in here. Marabou. Now, I said marabou, but I come to find out this is woolly bugger marabou. And what I like is this part of it. Uh, it's quite wide. Yeah. It, 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 can, it, can it have one of yours first? One of your, here, is, here is what's called a blood marabou. And it works really good if you're doing other than this type of tail. And we'll talk about why that tail is important. God, come on out here. But here's what happens with this one. Let me pull out one feather. I'm not going to tear it off, but see, see, look, see, see the tips? Yeah. Look at the difference in the, in the style of the tip of the feather that you're looking for back here. This will all completely collapse as if it wasn't here. You might as well have used these fibers here. Whereas this won't collapse that way. So it really is a difference. And when I came across the blood marabou, because I was tying some of these originally, like, like this one I tied uh, was with the blood marabou, but you can tell, look, look at the difference in the tail, tail style. Um, here's another one, but I used, here, here's a dark garala. Look at how much the tail looks so different. Okay? So the, um, the tail does make a difference and, on the way it's fished. So you're going to use two blood marabous and we're going to cut it and all the rest of the stuff can be used for other things because we're basically using the tips of these feathers mm -hmm. right so uh, color to match the thread uh, in the pattern that I came across it was a hot orange little flasher boo across the tail you might be able to see that there let me turn it a little bit you can see the orange flasher boo right Why and do you call it blood marabou? Who knows? <laughs> because that's the name they gave to it yeah. Nothing to do with blood, then. I don't know. And then for 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 the legs, um, it's just dyed olive uh, pheasant rump, and you can use you know just uh, the completely olive olive, or you can come into here, like I did here, and use the uh, light and dark. Uh, I don't really think the fish cares. I think it's it's there more for us than anything. But and this is a really. Re you know, I, everybody talked about, well, this is a simple fly. This one truly is. And from a hook standpoint, where did my hooks go? From a hook standpoint, I'm going to be tying on the 200, but you can also tie it on a 3 extra long. So any 3 extra long nymph hook is fine. So a TMC 200R or a TMC 5263, they both work just fine. And if you wanted to, to get really fancy with it, you could even take and put a bead head on it or a couple of turns of, uh, of copper wire under the head to give it a jig motion. Because this would be fished with a sinking line, by the way. Because this fly wasn't meant to have, a, have weight and fall to itself. It was meant to be a pretty neutral buoyant fly. So you fish it on a sinking line and stripping will create the pulsation. Okay. So you're going to start your thread just behind the eye, and I just spiral it back because the days of needing a full, full coat of thread are long gone since we don't put enough tacky wax on our thread to make things keep them slipping. I figure the rough ridges work best. So now for the tail. You're going to want your tail to be about as long as the hook. Right, so you're going to strip your feather back, pull back the stuff you're not using, and pull out this tip of the tail. What I like, what I like to do, and you can either wet your marabou with by licking your fingers, or you can keep a dish of, of water. Some people like to do a dish of water, others will lick their fingers. I've been licking my fingers for 20 years, so I lick my fingers. Right? Okay. Two turns right in the crook. Get it back on top, retreat it until it's the right length. That's why I like to leave it all together because it gives you a nice handle. Okay, you got it tied on top. Take a couple more turns to lock it in place. You don't need any of this anymore, so that's gone. Don't trash it. There's a lot of other good looking damselflies that use this type of marabou, both for the body and tail. 
So you don't trash this. <laughs> this is a really good feather. Well, you can if you got more money than I have. But I don't. I, I, I don't trash the fly at all. I don't trash that at all. Okay? Let's top, cinch that down really well. <laughs> Here is where you put in the orange. Flash, crystal flash. Okay, so just two fibers on each side. I just fold it over and I, I, I bring it over so that I have two on each side at the time. <clears throat> Capture it with a couple of turns. Run it over to the other side. Clip it to length. And you've got your orange flash of it, which is... At this point, I come back to the other feather. It does take two feathers. Now, I have tried one of these flies. I have this one here. I have taken and stripped this off, tied it in, and used it for the back. But in the pattern, you're supposed to take a separate feather. Okay, concave up. Tie it in by the tips. Right on top. I like to run my thread and lock all that, those little fibers down so they're nice and neat. Okay, bring your thread back and at this point create a dubbing loop. the dubbing loop and I assumed everybody knew what I did. Let me go back and do that again. When you're creating a dubbing loop you want to make sure that you don't just tie your loop and leave an open end on it. For instance, let me do it right here. If I was to do this, I don't know if you can see it, but there's a big gap here. I want this closed. And the way you close that is you run your thread over it See the loop closed? Then I lock it down. Now I've got a closed loop for my material so it can't slide past it. So in this case I'm doing a dubbing loop um, all the way at the rear of the fly because that's where I'm going to put in my dubbing. Now when you look at that photo uh, and when I, was, when I saw the fly tied I would more than likely want to call this not a damsel fly, but a dragon fly for as fat as he makes the body. Now it's important on this to stop the stop your thread part of the way up the front. You don't want to bring it all the way up the end. I'll show you why in a second. Okay, so at, so at this point we're going to take some of our dubbing. Okay. Okay. We take our dubbing. We're going to hold our loop open with our fingers and insert our dubbing into the loop. Now, there are two ways to do that. Some folks will actually, before they make the loop, will actually lightly dub the base thread, then make the loop. I don't think it end, you end up with as shaggy a body as I would like. So what you're going to do is you're just simply lightly laying your dubbing in between the two pieces of thread that created the loop. Okay? Take your shepherd's wand, spin it. Maybe get this up a little higher. There we go. Spin it. There's a lot of tools for spinning. You can use almost any tool that you find comfortable. I happen to prefer this. Now what helps tighten the loop up is even though I'm spinning down way down low, if you take your finger and you roll it up, you see it tighten up? So you can actually tighten it up while you're doing that. See that? So you want it fairly tight. And the way you know it's tight enough is can you see the see the see the thread kinking? Mm -hmm. Then you know you're tight. The reason you want it tight is to keep the material locked in there. Now the advantage of this is you can take and thin out your dubbing if you felt you were too thick at this point. 
I can reduce how thick my dubbing is by just pulling out some of the fibers. They'll break loose, okay? So at this point, I'm simply going to dub my body. Only up to where I said my thread was to end, which is exactly where I started my thread. Because this other segment creates the head of the fly, right? Take two turns, move that out of the way, bring this back. Okay, put a little spiral loop of thread because what I'm going to down do is the feather I tied in backwards, I'm going to pull all the way over as a back. Okay, one. Two, three is all I need. Don't get rid of this because you're going to use this again. The feather is multi-use. At this point, I'm going to tie in the legs. The legs are coming from the pheasant rump, and I happen to like using this parts of it because I don't get to use this for too many other things. So I simply take the feather. Oh, I forgot the orange. Oh, well. Don't forgive me. My crystal flash. Crystal flash is supposed to get tied in way back, and I forgot that more often than not. But for the legs... Clip the tip. There's my legs. Lay my legs right on top. Tight and snug. Cut off the excess. Come back to my dubbing. Oh, not my, you notice my my tying thread is back where, my, where I started to tie everything in, right? So I'm back to my, my dubbing loop, right? So now I'm going to take my dubbing loop and I'm going to run this all the way up to the eye. And then I'm going to run it all the way back to my tying thread. Tie it off. Clip the excess. Take this, the marabou, pull it over the top with one quick turn underneath to get to the head. Right, bring it over the top, right at the eye. One, two, pull the marabou back, one turn underneath, back to what I'm calling the knuckle or the joint, which would be where I started everything, a couple of turns, and it would finish it. The hardest part of this fly is learning how to manipulate marabou, how to deal with marabou. Okay, because there's nothing else to this fly. And then for the wing case, hold it up, trim back. And there's your damsel nymph. 